I want you to imagine a game. A game that from the moment of its release has been in a constant state of change. A game that in a single moment vaulted a majority of its content while also rendering most of its remaining content pointless. This game is Destiny 2. Destiny 2 is transformed into something completely different from what it was originally at its launch in late summer of 2017, and it's no secret that it's had more than its fair share of controversies in the last few months. Destiny as a franchise has always been surrounded by criticisms and community drama. But this video isn't going to be about that today. In this video, we will be talking about everything. The experience that Destiny 2 has had from its launch in 2017 all the way to the end of Season of Arrivals isn't what the game is like today, and that's what I want to talk about, the game's evolution, and why it's been so special for me and so many others to watch and experience this game grow from sort of a disappointment of year one all the way to the end of Shadowkeep, and everything in between. While I plan on this video going over the game that was Destiny 2, as best I can, I just wanted to make some things clear. Destiny 2 is a huge game with tons of history and details to go over from these last three years, and I'm not perfect. So no matter how much research I do, I'm gonna miss some things in this video. But I welcome any corrections to errors I make or any additions you may want to add in the comments. Also, I'm not the biggest fan of the Crucible slash PvP side of the game, so I apologize if you find that I neglect that side of the game in this video. So strap in and get ready. This is the game that was Destiny 2. Destiny 2 started out in the most perfect way possible. Before any gameplay or anything new, the game paid tribute to your achievements of the previous installment of the franchise, Destiny 1, and showed all your notable moments. Things like your first time you completed a campaign or your first time raid completions were displayed with the dates you completed them and who you did them with. And this was just extremely nostalgic and honestly awesome to be taken back to the days of Destiny 1 and just quickly relive everything that had built up to the moment of Destiny 2's release. So from there you were prompted to start a new adventure. Once you had made your character class choice of Titan, Warlock, or Hunter, the game would begin and you enter Destiny 2's all new story, The Red War. The story begins with a cutscene of our three mentors slash the vanguard, greeting a disturbance outside the tower walls, and quickly realizing this disturbance is an attack on the Traveler, in the last city of humanity. And that's where we come in. As we fly into the last city, we see firsthand this attack, and once we land, we are confronted by Cabal of the Red Legion, the army we will mainly be up against throughout this campaign. As we fight through the ruins of our tower, we are reunited with some familiar faces, who direct us to go and try take down the main command ship of the Red Legion. As as we are doing this, we are hit with the reality of the situation. This attack was an attack on our light and the Traveler itself. So as we watch the Traveler be caged and our light fades away, we meet the main antagonist of this story, Gaul, leader of the Red Legion. Now after we literally get tossed around by Gaul, this is where things start to get serious. We have lost our light and we for the first time as Guardians are mortal, defeated, and scattered. Our ghost can heal but not resurrect us, so as we flee the last city, defeated and without any support, we enter one of the more interesting parts of this campaign. We wander away from the city we lost, seemingly with no hope as our power has been stripped from us by Gaul and the Red Legion. And as we take a journey through the wilderness, we notice a falcon that leads us to survivors and their leader, Hawthorne, who then takes us to the EDZ and the farm the game's new social space. We then recognize an image from a vision we had earlier after Gaul had defeated us, the Shard of the Traveler. We then fight our way through the forces of the Fallen, and once we are face to face with this Shard of the Traveler, bam, we get our light back. Now, I think this mission is a little strange, because I would have enjoyed going through the campaign a little more without my light to explore what the light means to a Guardian before we are just handed it back in the second mission of the campaign. It honestly seemed a little weird for Bungie to give us our light so early on in the story, especially after for the first mission, but it is what it is I guess. So now this makes us the only guardian with our light. We once again are able to be brought back from the dead, giving us an edge on Gaul and his forces whose goal is revealed through many different cutscenes that he has trapped the traveler and plans on taking the light to give himself power and immortality. This basically sets the stage for the rest of the story. Throughout the rest of the campaign, your goal is to reunite the Vanguard as they are scattered after the attack, and you'll need their support to save the Traveler and defeat Gaul, especially after it's revealed that the Red Legion is essentially holding Earth hostage with its giant sun-destroying ship, the Almighty. So any attack on Gaul without first disabling the Almighty will result in the sun's and Earth's destruction. So, you reunite the Vanguard and disable the Almighty in one of the coolest missions 
happens in Destiny history. Then you make your way back to the last city to face Gaul, who now has officially taken a light and has a newfound power. You battle him and defeat him, but in a twist, he turns into a giant and appears to be unstoppable. And just when it looks like things aren't going well for your guardian, the traveler breaks free, now awoken from its slumber and destroys Gaul in one swift blow. This campaign was slightly divisive. With the quick summarization of the story I just gave you, I think you can tell that it's not the greatest story ever to be told, but it's far from the worst, and that's where I more or less stand. Destiny 2's campaign gets the job done, and has a couple of really cool missions while also acting as kind of a tutorial for the rest of the game, by introducing the player to the never-before-seen destinations, some new supers that weren't in the previous game, and also tease what was to come next in the story with the ominous cutscene that totally didn't leave us hanging for the next couple of years. But what was there after the campaign? What was Destiny 2's endgame like at launch? The answer? Not that great. Though Destiny 2 highly improved the patrol experience over Destiny 1 with the introduction of public event countdowns, lost sectors, adventures, and more, the game lacked incentive. This game took a more casual approach to things than Destiny 1 did, and that caused some problems. The hardcore players felt that the game was too casual and lacked a grind with the removal of things from Destiny 1 like random rolls, weapon and armor progression, and the lack of subclass grind and customization, and much more. But there were some good things that Destiny 2 offered. As I said, the patrols got the welcome additions of lost sectors, adventures, and just better overall public events with heroic difficulty options, and each destination had a vendor to level up and gear to earn. The new supers, though not as customizable as Destiny 1, were pretty fun, and all the base activities from Destiny 1 I would say returned in some way, shape, or form, but they weren't immune to changes either. Crucible, though it would later down the road become 6v6, launched as a 4v4 mode. Instead of Trials of Osiris, we got Trials of the Nine. Faction rallies made their debut, and Strikes of course made a grand return. So that leaves us with one more activity. The activity that Destiny is known for. The activity that excites the community the most. And on September 13th, 2017, we would receive an invitation to grow fat from strength. Now I think we can all agree that Destiny's saving grace is and probably always will be the raids. And this also applies to Destiny 2. These six man mechanic heavy boss encounters usually guarantee some desirable loot, fantastic gameplay, and memories you will cherish forever. But Leviathan is no different. Now there are some things you need to keep in mind for raids, or really any activity pre-forsaken that actually sounded fun. No matter how well done an activity may have been executed by Bungie, it was hard to get over the fact that there were no random roll drops, so there was no grinding weapons. And pre-forsaken, we had a pretty crappy double primary system, so that also brought a damper on the game, so just keep that in mind for year one content. But all that aside, Leviathan is one of my favorite raids. It has such a cool setting and the encounters are very unique and special in their own ways. The boss fight is fantastic and puts you supposedly up against the Emperor of the Cabal, Kallus, who has invited you to his planet-eating ship after he had received word that we had defeated Gaul. So after you triumph over Kallus' gardens, baths, and the gauntlet encounters, you are ready to face him, and as you make your way through the fantastic mechanics and begin to fight the Emperor, it's revealed that he was a robot the whole time, and that real Emperor Kallus was nowhere to be seen. This raid, before it was vaulted, was pretty easy but also a really great time and has provided a lot of good memories for me and my friends. So as we entered the loot room and see that Callus is an army of robot Calluses, we knew that there was no shortage of Calluses to fight, giving us reason to return to the Leviathan raid over and over. But little did we know this planet-eating ship would be in our future many more times. In October of 2017, we would receive our first prestige version of a raid with Prestige Leviathan. October also brought the community Destiny 2's first Iron Banner, as well as the game finally launched on Battle.net, giving Destiny its first PC port, and the fans loved it. But as December of 2017 crept around the corner, Destiny 2 would receive its first expansion.
To close out 2017, Destiny 2 Curse of Osiris was released, making it the first of two paid expansions that would release the year following the launch of the game. Now, I think it's easy to make a video like this and make it appear like the content in the game was keeping players happy, but Curse of Osiris, though it brought a new campaign, a new patrol, two new strikes, the game's first raid layer, and more, is considered to be the game's lowest point. Player interest was low. A lot of players had already left Destiny 2 due to the fact that history was starting to repeat itself. Remember Destiny 1? That released two mediocre overpriced expansions, then finally fixed the game into a state that players loved with the release of a $40 expansion? Well, Destiny 2 would basically do exactly that. Game comes out for $60. Game's not finished and lacking content. Game tries to sell overpriced DLC that should have been in the game at launch. Game charges you $40 more to play the game as how it should have released. Destiny 2 looked like it was going after your wallet just like Destiny 1 did, so a lot of players didn't even bother staying around for DLC. And the content that Curse of Osiris offered wasn't that great either. The content can be summed up perfectly in one word. Small. Mercury was small. The campaign was small. The raid layer Eater of Worlds was small. Not to mention when Curse of Osiris released, they made the baller move to lock players out of content that was already in the base game. So things like Prestige Leviathan, Prestige Nightfalls, and Trials of Osiris were no longer available unless you paid Bungie money. Now these changes made players so upset that they actually ended up rolling them back later down the road, but that didn't matter to people. Once you start locking players out of content they already own, that's going to be the last straw and they're going to leave. So you have content that didn't seem worth the money and players being locked out of the game's base activities. But the thing I think players hated the most is the Eververse. Microtransactions were out of control and players wanted to be able to earn the new cosmetics that came with the expansion. But Eververse was handled how most in-game stores were at the time. It didn't really matter you spent money on the expansion already, they wanted you to spend either more money on the shop or make you feel like you can earn the content, but the catch is you have to play the game for literally hundreds of hours to have any sort of chance at getting it. So though Curse of Osiris introduced two very good strikes, a sort of interesting story about Osiris trying to prevent the Vex from finding a future in the infinite forest where there is no light, and a raid layer, which isn't necessarily bad, just easy and not that big. It was and continues to be the lowest point Destiny 2 has ever been in most size. So what did Destiny 2 need, you ask? Well, if your answer was another expansion that asks players to spend more money, you would be right. It was now May of 2018. Curse of Osiris, though it also introduced the community to the game's first dawning, crimson days, and new weapons, had left players unhappy. So with Warmind, players were hoping for something better, and what they got was something better. Though Warmind isn't the greatest expansion to ever release, it was an improvement. It once again came with a short campaign about the Hive awakening on Mars, leaving Rasputin vulnerable to attack, so we team up with Anna Bray and Rasputin to defeat Nocris and Zol. And that's about it. It also came with a new patrol on Mars, two new strikes that I think are great, and a brand new raid layer, bringing us back to the Leviathan once again. Escalation Protocol was also introduced, bringing the community one of the best patrols Control, wave based and end game activities that wasn't a raid. It had good weapons, a lot of enemies, and also let you utilize the Valkyrie Javelin, a piece of weaponry you could use from Rasputin that was also featured in the game's campaign. The thing I remember Warmind the best for is it introduced the community to one of the best missions and secrets ever into Destiny the Whisper mission. This mission was secretly added onto Aya when we had to figure it out all on our own. The reward was one of the best guns in the game, the Whisper of the Worm, a return of Destiny 1's Black Spindle. This exotic dominated a lot of the encounters in the game, and this mission was just a really big hit with the community as we love it when secrets are added into the game. The raid layer Spire of Stars was more of a challenge than the previous raid layer Eater of Worlds and is by many considered to be the hardest raid ever, simply due to the fact that everyone has to know what they are doing more so than others. Raids. Throughout the rest of Warmind, we would receive prestige raid layers in the Solstice of Heroes event, but many were concerned about Destiny 2's future. We weren't even a year into the game, and with many players leaving and all the problems that I mentioned, like the double primary system and no random roles growing extremely old, there wasn't really any certainty on what would happen next. Warmind and Curse of Osiris were kind of just more Destiny 2 content and hadn't really fixed or addressed any of the game's main issues. So players were anxious to see what would happen in what I think to be Destiny's biggest make or break moment, and Bungie was about to deliver on more than we ever could have imagined.
A new story, two new destinations, new strikes, Gambit, The Last Wish Raid, nine new supers, Bows, The Scorn, the removal of double primary, random rolls and triumphs added. The list goes on and on for what Forsaken had in store for us. From the moment it was revealed, Forsaken came with a promise. Change. Change that would address most of the community's concerns. Change that promised Destiny 2 becoming a better game. Change that would begin with Forsaken's all-new campaign. Forsaken took a different approach to its story, a more bold and darker one. At its core, it's a revenge story giving the player one goal, to avenge the death of the fan-favorite character Cade Six, who was killed by Aldrin Sov and his scorned barons during a prison break in the Reef's Prison of Elders. Cade's death was a huge move by Bungie, as he was by far the game's most popular character, but his death paid off. If there was one thing to get players to drop $40 for an expansion, it would be the opportunity to put a bullet into Uldren, and players definitely paid up. Forsaken brought a ton of people back to Destiny 2 and was a huge turning point for the game's life. The campaign introduced you to a new location, the Tangled Shore, and its vendor, the Spider. The prison break had caused havoc on the Tangled Shore, so in exchange for helping the Spider with fighting off the Scorn, the expansion's new enemy type, he would provide you with information on Kate's killers, the Scorn Barons. One by one, you hunt and kill them, leading you eventually to their leader, the Scorn Fanatic. Once you defeat him, you enter the Watchtower to confront Uldren, but through a series of cutscenes, it's revealed that Uldren was a pawn being manipulated into thinking he was actually freeing his long-lost sister Mara, but in reality, he was a puppet of Riven, the last Ahamkara. Riven had infiltrated his mind in an attempt to free herself from the Dreaming City, and though he put an end to Uldren for what he did to Cade and stopped this from happening, this sets the stage for the biggest, and in my opinion, the greatest raid in Destiny history. The raid takes place in the Dreaming City, which is also a patrol being the second one introduced in Forsaken. But before we get into the raid in the Dreaming City, there's still a lot to talk about. But if I'm gonna be honest, I'm not sure where to start. Gambit. Gambit was a breath of fresh air when it came out. It introduced us to the Drifter and brought Destiny's PvP and PvE together in this fun hybrid mode that was a great addition to the game. Supers. Each class got three new super customization trees with Forsaken, one for each damage type, and to this day, many of them are extremely meta. Bows. Triumphs. Triumphs were back in Destiny, giving players challenges to grind, triumph score to flex, and titles to earn, giving even the most hardcore of players something to consistently grind. Weapon changes. Random rules were added to Destiny 2, and this made players very happy, and to make it even better, the double primary system was out the window. We now had more ways to play, and with a new mod and masterwork system, weapons were better than ever. So I think it's time to get into the meat and potatoes of what Forsaken offered. I want to tell you about a place. A place known as the Dreaming City. The Dreaming City is host to some of Forsaken's best content. In every way imaginable, it's magical. Its looks are stunning, its music is fantastic, and on the patrol side of things, it is by far the most in-depth patrol experience we've ever received. The Dreaming City patrol is on a three-week cycle, so every week there would be new puzzles to complete, secrets to discover, and just overall a reason to come back to find out what was different. It was a huge step for patrols, and to this day hasn't really been matched. On the third and final week of the Dreaming City cycle, you could do a new activity in one of Destiny 2's other great secrets, the Shattered Throne Dungeon. This was the first dungeon introduced to Destiny and players loved it. Take your raid mechanics, a couple of bosses, and make it a three-man activity and BAM! You had a dungeon. So you had an ever-changing patrol that over time revealed the all-new dungeon and activities like the Blind Well and the Ascendant Challenge. But something had to set this three-week cycle in motion. It would have been kinda weird if this all happened with no explanation. So that brings me to the crown jewel of Forsaken, the Last Wish Raid. Last Wish was pretty hyped up by the devs of Bungie, claiming it was the biggest raid ever with the most bosses and encounters ever to be featured in a raid. So people had some big expectations, but Bungie did not disappoint. This raid is amazing. Amazing in scale, amazing in looks, amazing with the encounters it introduced. To really simplify your goal, you basically are tasked with destroying Riven, the last Ahamkara. So you'd think setting out to destroy a giant magic dragon would be cool, right? 
Well, that's an understatement. This raid had you fight through witches, ogres, puzzles, and the finale literally has you slay and claim the heart of a giant dragon. So as you slay Riven and claim her heart, you ultimately unleash a curse. This curse is the reason behind the Dreaming City cycle, and why throughout the weeks the city will become more and more corrupt by Taken forces and Taken blights. This raid's events are felt throughout the world, which if you're a story guy is really cool and gives the raid a more significant feeling than some others. So with what Forsaken had to offer, I think I've wrapped it up nicely. So now Destiny 2 would enter a new era, an era of seasonal content. Now, if there's one beef I've always had with Destiny, it's been the price. When I bought Forsaken, I was under the impression I'd be getting everything Destiny 2 offered in its second year, and though I got access to content like seasonal events, which was nice with things like the game's first festival of the lost, introducing the haunted forest, and other events like the revelry and solstice of heroes, but if you didn't spend $30 on top of the $40 you had just spent on Forsaken, you would be missing out. So what did this seasonal content offer? Well, let's start with the first of Destiny 2's new seasonal model, the Black Armory, or Season of the Forge. The Black Armory introduced us to Ada 1 as a vendor and her armory of very impressive weapons that people still use, like Yotung and Izanagi's Burden. The seasonal activity took the shape of forges, and the highlight of this season was the release of the Scourge of the Past raid. One of the most fun, interesting, and well done raids that holds a very special place in my heart. But probably the best thing about this raid was its exotic weapon, the Anarchy Grenade Launcher, which is considered by many to be the best exotic in all of Destiny 2. So you got a new raid, a seasonal activity, and more, but Destiny 2 would soon have maybe its most significant change this season, and it would not come in the form of any activity. On January 10th, it was announced that Bungie and Activision were splitting up with Bungie retaining the Destiny IP. Bungie has split from Activision. Bungie has just announced that they'll be splitting with Activision to assume full publishing rights for the Destiny franchise. Bungie had officially broken away from Activision, and to the excitement of many had maintained the rights to the Destiny IP. This was huge news, not just for the Destiny community, but for gaming in general. These things don't usually happen, but Bungie and Activision had had a lot of tension between them with the launch of Forsaken. Basically, Activision wasn't happy with the sales of the expansion, even though it was an extremely crowd-pleasing DLC. Bungie themselves even came out and said they were extremely proud of what they had made, and this caused more tension with the publishers, saying it was a disappointment. And on top of that, Activision wanted Bungie to start on Destiny 3, which Bungie was against as they felt it would upset the players to have to restart with the new game. So somewhere down the line, the two companies cut ties, and from now on, Bungie would be self-publishing. This came with some pros and some cons. Pros being, Bungie would have complete freedom and control to do what they want with Destiny from here on out. The cons being, Bungie would no longer have the funding and the support studios that Activision provided. So once the rest of the annual pass content was released, Bungie would be on their own. Season of the Drifter came next in the content lineup with the addition of Gambit Prime, the Reckoning PvE mode, and some story content about the Drifter. No raid would release this season, but that was okay because Season of Opulence would deliver where Season of the Drifter didn't. But before we talk about Season of Opulence, the next season in the annual pass, it's important to take note that Season of the Drifter brought yet another great secret into Destiny. Much like the Whisper mission, Zero Hour was dropped into the game, secretly, and would have us return to the Old Tower to stop the Fallen from claiming a familiar weapon, the Outbreak. This weapon with its catalyst was really good and was actually one of the best options for the raid that was introduced in the next season we are going to talk about, Season of Opulence, the final season in the annual pass. This season would once again bring us back to the Leviathan to participate in activities like the Menagerie, the game's first six-man match made activity. We also got the great addition of the Tribute Hall and the Raid Crown of Sorrow dropped. This season had a little bit of everything, and by many is considered to be the best season Destiny 2 has ever received, but this season also marked the end of an era. This season was the last bit of content worked on by Activision and Bungie together. From here on out, Bungie was on their own, so players waited to see what would happen with a newly independent studio. And and Bungie would reveal what was next for Destiny 2.
Lockheed marked the beginning of a new age. An age free of Activision. An age of free to play. An age of player friendly features like cross save. Many people assume that most of Destiny 2's mistakes were at the fault of Activision. But I think even with the addition of these player friendly practices, Shadowkeep showed us this wasn't necessarily true. Shadowkeep brought us all a lot of good changes that I'm going to get to, but I think it's a good idea to go over the things players didn't like. Starting with recycled content. The moon, though it had a new activity in the Altar of Sorrows and some new areas that weren't in Destiny 1, was mostly recycled content. Nightmares and Nightmare Hunts put you up against recycled bosses. Shadowkeep also offered no vendor refresh and Eververse once again seemed a little too greedy. All of these things put a bad taste in the new players' mouths and the old players who had already fought these bosses and patrolled the moon in Destiny 1 had even less reason to be excited since none of this content was new to them. But even with all of those issues, Shadowkeep shines in some regards. The campaign brings us back the fan favorite character Eris Morn, and we are tasked with entering the newly discovered Darkness Pyramid to learn what we can about this re-emerging foe behind the collapse. This campaign, after replaying it for this video, honestly isn't anything special, but not exactly exactly terrible. Most criticize this story for ending as soon as it gets good, which is when we recover an artifact that has a strange signal. We follow this strange signal and it leads us to one of Shadowkeep's non-recycled activities, the Garden of Salvation Raid. Now, I personally really like this raid. It's beautiful, it's big, and it's got a really cool exotic quest built within it that grants the player the divinity, a very unique trace rifle that is used for a lot of boss DPS phases. Other activities and features that Shadowkeep introduced to the community that were pretty liked include Armor 2.0, Finishers, the Pit of Heresy Dungeon, and the addition of champions in different Nightfall difficulties. Shadowkeep, though not being anywhere near the level of a forsaken sized expansion in scale or praise, brought a lot to the table and was honestly one of the best times to be a Destiny player, not because of the expansion itself, but due to all the content from every other season and every other expansion. Destiny 2 had entered its third year, and with everything we had gone over in this video, I think you can tell by Shadowkeep there wasn't a lack of things to do, even if this expansion wasn't the best. Destiny 2 was full of content, and it would get more as it's time to enter the home stretch of this video. Shadowkeep's Seasonal Content Shadowkeep's seasons were different. Every season now introduced a sort of battle pass, with armor sets, materials, exotics, emotes, finishers, etc. Each season also introduced a new seasonal artifact to level up and would have a featured set of mods that would be useful during the season. So, let's start with Season of the Undying, a season that featured the Vex as the main threat. This season released with Shadowkeep and featured the Vex Offensive, a new six-man activity that would have us fight huge waves of a Vex invasion, leading us to eventually slaying the Undying Mine at the end of this season. The season by many is considered pretty average, nothing too much to complain about, but nothing super special either. The next season on the list is my personal favorite, Season of the Dawn. I think I love this season so much because it had so many things going on. You had the Sundial, a pretty fun, once again, six-man activity that put you on Mercury to face off against the Red Legion. Region, a great storyline with missions to play where we go back in time to save Saint-14, the greatest titan who ever lived, and other features like obelisks, the corridors of time puzzle, and charged with light mods. This season just had a lot going on and was pretty good if I do say so myself, but I can't say that about the next season. Season of the Worthy is remembered for a broken pinnacle weapon quest, the introduction of Trials of Osiris which was quickly a dead mode because of no proper anti-cheat, the most divisive seasonal event of all time, Guardian Games, and the first live event in Destiny that wasted hours of my life for maybe one minute of something cool. The Almighty was hurtling towards the last city, so we turned to Rasputin to save us in our hour of need. That's about all the context you need for this season's story. Throughout the season, you participate in the public event known as the Seraph Towers and charge up Rasputin's army of Golden Age technology so that he might destroy the Almighty before it reaches the Earth. And that's what happens. On paper, it all sounds great, but in reality, this season had players grinding a public event for months. And the only good things to come out of this season is of course its exotics, but more importantly, Warmind Cell mods. Probably the most powerful mods in the game. This season is considered to be the lowest point the game has ever been since Curse of Osiris and causes a lot of doubt about the game's future, but Bungie would soon reveal their plan for the next chapter of Destiny 2, and it would all come into place with Season of Arrivals. Season of Arrivals was in a lot of ways peak Destiny 2. In this season, the darkness had arrived and we would do our best to understand why. A new dungeon to everyone's surprise was released and the event Moments of Triumph let us celebrate all the raids, but many changes were announced with the end of this season. 
Other activities during the Season of Arrivals would include the Contact Public Event, the Means to an End quest where you fight off the Hive Forces, and some great exotic guns. But this season would mark the end of an era. Beyond Light was on the way and Bungie announced that most of the Red War, Curse of Osiris, and Warmind content would leave to make way for the future. On top of that, all the content except for the raids from Forsaken and Shadowkeep would have their gear sunset, so you would lose 3 years of weapons you've collected being relevant. These moves have given Bungie a lot of grief and honestly has left a hole in Destiny 2 that Beyond Light just hasn't been able to fill. Bungie has still been insistent though that Destiny 2's best days are ahead of it with the announcement of Witch Queen and Lightfall, but many people have had their doubts that this is true. With the removal of 4 destinations, 7 strikes, 3 campaigns, and 5 raids, it's been hard on a lot of players, as many of them felt that the content that has left the game is what made it special in the first place. But that's not for me to decide. This video is about the game's growth, and maybe in 2 years once the game hits the end of the Lightfall expansion, I'll make another video like this. But for today, that's gonna be it. Here's to hoping that Destiny's best days are ahead. Tell me down below what your favorite Destiny 2 moment has been throughout this long journey that we've been through, and why the game has been so special to you. But for now, that's all for me. I've been Multiple Muffins. Peace.